While that was an interesting and possibly entertaining variation, clearly something's not functioning quite as it ought to. So I've been using my simple memory test program to fill the upper 32k bytes of RAM with a randomly generated set of data, and then having it repeatedly read that back to check for inconsistencies. You can find a copy of the program and a short description of what it does at the website zx.zig.net, should you be interested. The Sinclair 128k Spectrum and this version of the Plus 2 have two sets of 64 kilobytes of RAM. Each is provided by eight 4164 ICs, each handling one bit of every byte of the set of 64 kilobytes it's part of. One of these sets can be accessed by the CPU and the ULA, and so access is contended in the same way as the lower RAM in 48k spectrums. The other set is not contended and is only available to the CPU, like the upper RAM of the earlier models. Paging hardware allows software to map 16 kilobyte blocks of RAM from these two 64 kilobyte sets into various positions of the Z80's memory map. There's a brief description of how this works towards the rear of the 128k Spectrum manuals. When a basic program is running, the first 16k of RAM, that is the 16k immediately above the ROM in the memory map, is mapped from the contended set of RAM and the upper 32k from the non-contended set. This achieves the same effect as the division between upper and lower RAM in 48k spectrums. This RAM test program isn't aware of the paging mechanism and so can't test all of both sets of 64 kilobytes. However, it's still a useful program to run because in most cases, our OIC fault affects all of its bits and so will still be detected. Though of course, this program alone can't guarantee all of the RAM is working perfectly and it doesn't test the paging system at all. You can see here it has reported a fault at address 46865. The report suggests there might be something wrong with IC24, which is responsible for bit position 7 of all bytes of non-contended RAM. The program will have started its test at address 32768 and worked its way up the address space. It's interesting that it didn't discover a fault until it had tested almost 14 kilobytes of RAM. This suggests the fault doesn't affect all bits of IC24 or that it's intermittent. I've run the program again, and like before, it suggests IC24 is faulty. However, this time it ran a considerable number of passes of the test before uncovering the fault. Further runs continue for varying lengths of time before stopping, and report faults not involving IC24. The program runs from the lower 16k of RAM, and so a fault there could cause confusing error reports when testing the upper RAM. I don't think that's the case here though. I've had this program test the lower RAM for a considerable length of time, and it didn't report any faults. Also, you saw it running Horace Go Skiing, a program that only uses the lower, contended RAM, and it didn't seem to encounter any difficulties. Because of the intermittent nature of the faults, and because they aren't specific to any particular RAM IC, I think the cause is not a faulty RAM IC, but something else, disrupting accesses of the non-contended RAM. Using the highly advanced diagnostic technique of prodding with a finger, I've discovered I can make the computer crash if I press gently on the circuit board here. Interestingly, I can't do the same if I lift the board off the bench a little and flex it around this position. I can press quite hard on the components on the top surface and nothing happens. However, if I place a finger underneath and the thumb on top and squeeze gently, there we go, the computer crashes. Interestingly, if I reach a bit further in, and squeeze here, it doesn't have any effect. These ICs here form the set of 64k from which the contended or lower banks are selected, and these ones are the upper banks, so I'd have expected the fault to have been affecting one of these and not these here. However, let's have a look on the other side of the circuit board in this area. Exactly at the point where I pressed to cause the problem, 
is this repair wire here that I assume was put in place because of a track that was damaged on the surface when the ICs were removed. I was planning to leave it in place because of how easily this circuit board is damaged. However, clearly something needs to be done and a closer investigation is necessary. Here's a close up of the repair wire. It connects pin 7 of IC25 to pin 7 of IC26. They're the pins that carry address line A1 of these RAM ICs. Now, probing it with a multimeter, I've been unable to disrupt that connection by flexing the wire. Also, it passes over the fairly sharp ends of several other pins. And again, testing with a multimeter, I've una been unable to detect a short between the wire and any of those pins caused by pressing on it. So I'm going to remove that wire and desolder these two IC sockets, clean up the board, inspect it closely, repair any damage, and hopefully that'll cure the problem. I've removed the two IC sockets along with an additional adjacent one, the one that was here, not because I think there was much wrong with it, but it was very poorly fitted. The pins at one end were barely through the circuit board. I was very pleased I managed to do this job without causing any damage to the PCB. I learned earlier on in my work on this spectrum not to use one of these. It removes the solder, but it also pulls the pad straight off the board. I have a use of uh, this continuous suction pump that was absolutely fine. It's probably difficult for you to see, but the track adjacent to pad 7 of IC25 is broken just here. However, I can't find any other damage. nor on the rear. I've checked for continuity between the various points at these ICs and it's all connected as it should be and I haven't been able to find any shorts. There are a couple of connections that look slightly dubious and they were the ones from this pad here that connects to a trace that goes up here and there's a scratch across the trace here but I've tested and no it's not broken and similarly this trace here is connected perfectly safely down through this via. So I'll have a go at repairing the broken track on the top side and then I'll fit new IC sockets. On closer inspection I've noticed that there's a track that doesn't connect to any of the RAM ICs that form the contended banks but does run right past them along here and at this point here right next to pin 7 where that repair wire was connected a bit of the solder mask is chipped off it. I don't think I did that while desoldering, though perhaps I did, but I suppose it's possible the repair wire had pressed down on that point and shorted to that track, and maybe that was the cause of the problem. Here's where I've repaired the broken track. I scraped the solder mask off the very end of the remaining part of the track, at this point here, and soldered down a very fine wire, which I've laid across the surface of the board following the path of the original track and fed it down through this hole where it'll get soldered in place once I fit a new socket. I've installed new sockets and refitted the RAM ICs. The good news is that the computer no longer crashes when I press on the circuit board, so that was clearly a job that needed to be done. However, sadly, as you can see here, the fault of intermittent problems affecting the contents of the non-contended RAM is still present. I still don't think it's due to any of the RAM ICs themselves because the symptoms are not what I'd expect in that case. However, it's a possibility that remains to be ruled out. Here are the 84164 ICs that formed the non-contended banks in the PLUS2 installed as the upper RAM in a 48k spectrum. And I'm not surprised to see that the memory test program doesn't find any faults in them. Now, when used as the upper RAM in a 48k spectrum, only half of their potential 64 kilobyte capacity is used, so they're not being fully tested. If I wanted, I could change the RAM type selection link on the circuit board, and then the program would test the other half. But I'm not going to bother. I really don't think there's anything wrong with these ICs. And to make absolutely certain, before refitting them to the plus two, I will move the ICs that I didn't remove. Those are the eight 4164s that form the contended RAM banks up to the non-contended sockets and install these ICs as the contended RAM banks instead. So if they are faulty, the problem on the plus two should move from the upper or non-contended RAM banks down to the lower RAM.
I've refitted all the RAM to the plus two in the way that I described, and the display you can see now is as a result of running the memory test program again on the plus two. And as expected, it's reporting errors when it's configured to test the top 32 kilobytes of the address space. It did so after a few passes, and it's also interesting to note that the test routine runs all the way through the block of memory it's configured to test and only stops either when it's reached the end of that block or when it's recorded 16 errors. So in this case, we can see it's reported a single error at address 48166, and it didn't find any more in that single pass of the block of 32 kilobytes. So again, that confirms that the error is relatively intermittent, and also it still doesn't look like a faulty RAM IC, because usually that causes errors at multiple addresses. Here, the test failed because it expected to find the value 56 at address 48166, having written that address to that location at the start of the test. However, it read the value 186. So then I realized I could discover a little bit more about the nature of this fault by entering the command you can see here at the bottom of the screen. In fact, I've already run it three times, and you can see it's reported 56. So this means that the value 56 still is at address 48166 in RAM, and that on this run at least, the error was due to a corruption of the data during a memory read. The value in the RAM hasn't been damaged. So I'm going to run the test a few more times and see whether that's consistently the case. I'll double check I typed that correctly because so far it's always been the case that the address has contained the value that was expected to be there, but that was an exception. It appears as if the contents of that address have actually been changed. 
I'd run it once more. So it appears that most often the error occurs during a read, but now and then either something damages the contents of RAM or something went wrong during the initial write of the test value. These tests have revealed some interesting information, but to progress I think I'll have to remind myself of the details of how the memory paging system works. The z 64 kilobyte memory address space is conceptually divided into four 16K sections, as shown here. I've named them A, B, C and D for easy reference and labelled the address of the first byte of each in decimal and hexadecimal. One of the two banks of ROM is always present in A. As previously mentioned, the 128K spectrum has two sets of 64 kilobytes of RAM. The Z80 has dedicated access to one of these and must share the other with the ULA. All of the RAM is divided into 16K banks, with bank 5 always being present in section B and bank 2 always in section C of the memory map. D is called the banked section, and any one of the banks of RAM can be presented here. Bank 0 is mapped to D by default. We can see that when the simple memory test program was running, it would have been testing all of banks 2 and 0 when asked to test the upper RAM. The memory configuration is controlled by a write-only I.O. port at address 7FFD hex. The first three bits set which RAM bank is presented in section D. Bit 3 selects whether the ULA retrieves display data from RAM bank 5, the default, or from bank 7. Bank 7 doesn't need to be mapped to section D for this bit to be set, but of course it must at some point, at least temporarily, if software is to set up anything to display there. Bit 4 selects which ROM bank is placed in section A. Finally, setting bit 5 high disables any further changes to the memory configuration until the computer is reset. Let's see at least in part how the hardware implements this paging system. Here's a diagram of the core digital systems in the PLUS2. The Z80 CPU is here on the left and the ULA is just disappearing off the page on the right hand side. This block here represents the 8 RAM ICs that form the contended banks of RAM and this other block the other 8 that form the non-contended banks. This custom IC here is exactly the same as the one introduced in the 48k issue 5 spectrum and it replaces the separate multiplexer ICs of the earlier versions. Now this custom logic IC does not know anything about the additional memory of the 128k spectrums. However it has two inputs here labelled TS1 and TS2. And those can be used to configure how this IC generates addresses for the non-contended RAM. In the 48k spectrums, 40 64 kilobit devices were used to provide the upper RAM. So it was necessary to be able to choose the non 40 half of each of these RAM ICs. RAM from different manufacturers was also supported, some requiring a 7-bit row address and an 8-bit column address, or the other way around. And the 48k spectrums had a set of wire jumper links that configured the logic signals sent into these two inputs, and they had to be set appropriately for the type of RAM in use. However here they are driven by IC7, which is another custom logic device, this time a small programmable array. By adjusting these two inputs here, it's able to decide to determine which of the four 16K banks of the non-contended RAM are to be accessed. It does a similar job for the contended RAM, where these two outputs here, which are used to set one bit of the row address and one bit of the column address via this 2 to 1 multiplexer, which is connected down to one of the address inputs of each of the RAM ICs. Down here, IC6 contains six D-type flip-flops and it holds the state of the memory configuration register that we looked at just a moment ago. Its inputs are connected to the first six bits of the data bus 
when its clock input here is strobed, it retains the state of those first six bits of the data bus. It then outputs them on various outputs here. These three here, B0, B1 and B2, are connected back up to IC7, and they're used to determine which bank of RAM is presented in the top 16K of the address space. One of the outputs, the ROM selection bit, is not too surprisingly connected to the ROM, so that determines which of the two pages of the ROM get presented in the first 16K of address space. There's another output that goes over to the ULA, to this input labelled VB, and that tells the ULA which bank of RAM it should retrieve the video data from. Finally, there's an output here on pin 15, and that's connected via a diode to the clock input. So when pin 15 is high, it forces the clock input to remain high, regardless of what happens at this point here. That locks the state of this IC, and so it cannot be changed further in software. When the computer is initialised, or the reset button pressed, the reset input here is pulsed low, and all the flip-flops are a reset so that all the outputs become logic zero again. The clock input here is provided again by IC7, and via some connections to address lines here, I assume it's decoding the I.O. address and providing the clock signal at the appropriate time. The tests I've done so far might suggest that RAM Bank 5 is working correctly and that the intermittent errors occur when accessing RAM Bank 2. I don't yet know about any of the other banks. Neither do I know whether the error is due to the particular RAM bank being accessed, or whether it's due to the location in the memory map where the RAM bank is positioned. So I've set up the computer to do some further tests to try to answer these questions. Now the 128k basic environment makes use of RAM bank 7, so that might prevent me from testing that. It also means that it must, at least now and then, update the memory configuration register, and that would interfere with me setting it manually to whatever value I want it to have for the purposes of testing. So I'm going to run the tests from 48k basic. Now that throws up another possible problem because on entering 48k basic the system sets bit 5 of the memory configuration register high and that blocks any further configuration changes. However that can be simply overcome by bending up pin 15 of IC6 as I've done here and that prevents the setting of bit 5 from having any effect, and so I'll be able to use the basic out command to update the memory configuration register. And just to prove a point, I've connected uh, this voltmeter here to the now disconnected pin 15 of IC6, and we can see it's showing close to 0 volts, a logic low. I've connected a keyboard from another plus 2 temporarily to allow me to type commands etc. So if I switch to 48k basic, we should see that output has now switched high. However, if I run the basic out command, to write 0 to port 32765, which is the I.O. address of the memory configuration register, it'll set all bits to 0, so we should see the voltmeter switch back to a logic low. I suspect the system will also crash or reset in some way when I do this because it's going to change the ROM selection bit and bring the 128k ROM back into the lower 16k. While preparing for the tests I want to run next, I've noticed another oddity. And that's that often when in 48k basic, Pressing the reset switch here doesn't always cause a clean reset, it seemed to work that time, but sometimes the basic environment simply hangs. Quite often it does reset, but after a long delay. Now that reset took longer than it should do. Now the computer's hung. So because of this, 
I used my oscilloscope to inspect what was going on at pin 26 of the CPU. Over here, that's its reset input. During normal operation that should be high at around 5 volts, but it should be pulsed low for a moment to force the CPU to reset. However, that didn't seem to be happening when I pressed the reset button. Pressing the reset button does reset the state of IC6, as possibly you saw here on the voltmeter, and I verified that the mechanical switch itself seems to be working properly. So, something's wrong that needs further investigation. After spending a while following tracks around the circuit board, I found what seems to be a broken track in the connection to the CPU's reset pin. At this point just here, I've added a blob of white paint to help me find the point again. Using this continuity tester, if I put one probe in this wire up here, and touch the other end to the end of the track, there's a connection. So I try on the other side of the pad, or this other pad down here which is also connected, or should be, there's no connection. Now I can't even see a break there if I inspect that point through a magnifying glass, but the continuity tester says otherwise. It looks as if the break is at this point here, leaving the reset input on pin 26 completely floating. That's certainly not a good thing at all. Now I don't know whether that's the cause of the intermittent memory faults, I wouldn't have thought so, but depending on where this trace, run, trace runs, it could perhaps be picking up some interference when certain areas of the RAM are accessed, and that could cause all sorts of strange effects, so certainly this needs to be put right. 